Hi, Robin Blake here from the Atlantic Elite team brokered by Virtue Properties Realty. Today, we have a special guest, mortgage industry expert, Elisa Smith. Since no two circumstances are the same, she specializes in providing a personalized home mortgage experience, and she'll share how you can receive down payment assistance to overcome the challenge of the minimum investment required for a mortgage. Stay tuned. With over 15 years mortgage experience, Elisa provides exceptional customer care all the way through to closing. Elisa, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. As we know, one of the barriers to home ownership is down payment. But before we get into the money, can you tell us just how does a mortgage work? Okay, so basically how a mortgage works, um, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background history on mortgages. Okay. So initially we're purchasing home many years ago, people actually didn't use mortgages, right? You had to build your own home or you were paying rent and, or people pay cash for properties. The mortgages actually didn't really come into play until around the 1950s. Um, so it hasn't really been that long ago. Um, and what happens is it, allow people to be able to borrow money to purchase housing because housing was needed. So um, the way the mortgage works is you're pretty much borrowing the money from the bank to purchase your property. And then they place your payments over a 10, 15, 20, 30 year, and now sometimes even 40 year uh, payback wow. to pay the mortgage in full. Oh, that's interesting. 40 years, that's a long time to be paying for a mortgage. Well, tell us what type of loan products do you have? Okay, so right now the loan products that we offer, we have USDA. Okay. Okay. USDA, that is for properties that are in low populated areas. Mm -hmm. um, and they also have a USDA map in case if you ever find a property, you want to find it if it's USDA approved, you can take a look at that. Oh, that's part of the uh, Department of Agriculture. We also have FHA, which that's Federal Housing Administration or HUD, Housing of Urban Development. And that is a government back loan. So what does that mean? That means that the government is actually backing the money for the banks for those loans. So the bank will offer you FHA loan and then the government is actually giving them back the money or you're paying them back. We also have conventional loans. Conventional loans are loans sold to banks just regular banks and the banks are actually funding those loans okay we also have what's called non-qualifying mortgages non-qualifying mortgages are those what they used to call before the market crash they were called subprime before the market crash but now they're called non-qualifying mortgages and how do you qualify for those those are your uh mortgages where you use your bank statements or you use assets to qualify, you're going to qualify non-traditionally. So with USDA, FHA, conventional, you're gonna qualify what we call full doc, meaning that we're they're gonna use your taxable income. Your taxable income, that's what they will use. And non-qualifying mortgages will use your income um, that is not taxable. Wow, that's interesting. I didn't realize that they were still doing non-qualifying mortgages after the whole subprime crash. You know, I guess they're done with a little more regulation now to make it safer. Well, yeah, what they're doing is they're requiring a higher down payment. Oh. Whereas before uh, in the subprime market, you know, you could have a 720 and then you could just close. <laughs> no, none of that anymore. Now they also want you to have a 720, even with non-qualifying mortgages, they still want you to have a 720 and they want to see your cash flow. And they're going to check your cash flow based on your bank statement right they're gonna check it and then they want you to actually place money put money down so they feel like if you're gonna put down 10 15 percent or 20 percent then it's a less a less riskier property because if you're able to save that much money you are responsible you're conscious about what you're doing and you're less likely to get foreclosed on versus if you purchased a home and all you did was sign your name mm -hmm. you didn't really have to do anything you don't have to work for sometimes it doesn't last and that's that's pretty much the concept with lindy oh wow that's interesting yep i i, I definitely get that when you have skin in the game it's a whole different ball game park for most 
So can you just share some of the current interest rates and like what's APR? Like what's the difference between that? We hear that back and forth and I'm not sure what that means. Okay. So the current interest rates, the rates change every day. Okay. Okay. So the, the rates are different and the rates are based on what's going on in the market. Just kind of like, can you still see me? I can. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the interest rates change daily. So sometimes just because if, if there's something going on in the market, then it will affect your interest rate. So just like voting, things that are going on in the political market, it could affect the rate. So a lot of times we kind of watch that. That'll kind of tell us, hey, well, the president is deciding about this. The rates may change, the rates may lower. <laughs> so the, the rates are affected every day based on what the market is dictating. Okay, um, so right now the rates are really good. So the rates right now are ranging anywhere and they're still based upon your credit. The rates are ranging anywhere from let's say two and a quarter to three and a half, depending on your credit. So right now the rates are really great. And historically, well, when I started in this business many years ago, you were lucky if you got an 8% interest rate. Right? Wow. I, and I remember the gentleman that I learned from, he has been in the business forever and he's probably in his 80s now. He said he remembered when rates were in the double digits when he started in the business. So, Wasn't that in the 80s? I think in the 80s, I remember the rates being yes. in the double digits. Mm-hmm. Yes, they were. Well, I was still in school they went. He was like, yeah, the rates, the rates were double digits and now the rates are eight. So now for us that have been in the business so long, we're like 3%. That's great. Believe it or not, there's still some people that are like, oh, I want lower, I want lower. And it's okay. If the if your credit dictates it and it's available to you, mm-hmm. then most definitely I always help my clients to get to the point. Like if they say, I want the best rate, what do I need to do? Mm-hmm. I will work with them, tell them everything they need to do to get the best rate. So like, for example, with the non-qualifying mortgages, those rates tend to be a little bit higher because those are riskier loans. Okay. Uh-huh. So those interest are going to range all the way up to 6%. Mm-hmm. I also have non-qualified mortgages where you can purchase a home in your business name. Wow. But, but those rates are a little bit higher. Those rates are 7%. Okay. So, but that's still really a good rate. It and is. You know, we have to so talk I'm more about that. A, I'm getting off on a tangent. Please don't get upset. No, but no, no. This is great though, because I do want to know more about how you can qualify your business as an LLC to purchase the property. So, I mean, I guess that's a whole nother episode, but that's amazing. Yes, but this is the the, the issue that I think that the mindset of people have to grasp, okay? Mm -hmm. For example, when you go in to buy a car, Mm -hmm. most consumers, when they buy a car, they don't really haggle with the finance manager about the rate. (laughs) right they don't really haggle with them about the down payment it's very few people that go in unless you have excellent credit that go in and haggle with them about their down payment about their interest rate uh or their monthly payment it's kind of like take it or leave it if you don't want this car then we're going to give you the cars in the back right (laughs) and that and as you know a vehicle is a depreciating asset Absolutely. But people are more open to pay a higher interest rate. They have no problem paying 15, 25, 30% interest rate on a car. That's right. But then they come to buy a home and they're crying to me about an increase of 0.25 on the mortgage. And this is something that is appreciating. When you buy the home now, even in Atlanta, you know, you can buy the home today for 200,000, probably in six months, it's already worth 220. <laughs> yeah. It's appreciating. So the, the, the interest rates are important, but what's also important is how you approach things because I have to talk to my clients a lot about their cars and what is what is important it's an appreciating asset so the rates are important and there are other different tactics that you can do to pay down your mortgage a lot sooner so that interest rate is not affecting you so sometimes my clients they pay bi-weekly payments or they remember to pay their three extra payments per year they remember when they're supposed to refinance so they can reduce that 30 year down so that's that's a little bit about rates and why they're important and why they're not important and how to use them to pay off your debt sooner so that you're not paying the 
full amount or amortize over 30 years. So your annual percentage rate, that's covering over the entire life of the loan, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say you borrow 200,000. Well, by the time the 30 years are up, you may be paying closer to 400,000, but how do you avoid that? You avoid that by paying more each, each year. You pay more payments towards the principal each year and then you refinance it down so that you can pay it off soon. Wow, that, wow. Is, that is an awesome nugget. I hope people are taking notes. This is amazing. Well, you spoke a lot about credit score back and forth. So how does one qualify for a loan? Like what credit score is really needed? What's a safe number? We hear a lot of different, you know, numbers being thrown out there. Okay, so let me start from the bottom. FHA actually doesn't have a credit score requirement. The lenders have a credit score requirement. Wow. So each lender sets their requirement, right? Mm -hmm. And those, I'm just gonna give you some backdrop a little bit. So the lenders set their requirements based on their ability to sell the loans on Wall Street, right? Yes. So as a lender, if I decide I wanna take clients with 580 credit scores, mm -hmm. then I can do that, but maybe I'm holding those notes right? And my credit as a business is based upon how well my 580 clients pay their mortgages on time. Oh. Okay. And that allows me as a bank, as a banker to say, hey, I could go get more money to loan out to you guys for 580. But statistically speaking, people that have 580 tend to have a higher foreclosure rate. Mm. So other lenders will say, well, I don't want those 580 people because they're probably not going to pay. They're going to get behind. I'm going to end up having to foreclose on them and it's going to mess up my credit. And now I can't go borrow $10 million from Bank of America or $30 million from Chase. So no, I don't want you. I want a higher credit score. Okay. So 580. There are lenders that will allow 580. I can also do, I can also close loans at 580, but your interest rates tend to be a little bit higher and your down payment is higher. Your down payment is probably going to be closer to about 10%. Sometimes it can be lower than 10% because let's say if you have a 580, but it's just because all your credit cards are maxed out, but you don't have any charge offs or collections, right? Then the, the system, it's a computer underwriter. It's a computerized underwriting system will kind of dictate what goes on there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the next score up is around a 620. 620, a lot of lenders will accept 620. Okay. Before COVID, it was 620 all day. Okay. okay. After COVID, they actually had raised them. <laughs> I don't know if you saw, but even Chase on the news, they were like, our credit score requirement now is 700. So they, yeah. they, because those they consider people with lower credit scores are higher risk and they're less responsible and they're less likely to pay. So we have 580, 620. The sweet credit the sweet credit score is 640. Okay, 640 gets you in the door. It'll get for FHA. Mm -hmm. It will get you quality rate. It will get you a great rate. 640 FHA. Mm -hmm. um, it will also qualify you for the 100% finance loans. Mm -hmm. Now for conventional, that's a little bit different. And I also want to talk about first time home buyer. First time home buyer, that is a conventional product. It is a conventional product. There are mm -hmm. not, it's not like this major product. First time home buyer just means you have not purchased a home in the last three years and you don't have any delinquencies or late payments in the last 12 to 24 months. Mm -hmm. And you qualify for a first time home buyer program with 3% down conventional. Okay. Now, also with conventional, it is better that your scores are over 680 because they have a mortgage insurance component and your mortgage insurance, which that is the insurance that you pay to make sure that if you do foreclose, the bank will get their money back. So you're paying an insurance policy on your mortgage payment every month to guarantee that if you don't pay, that the bank can get their money back. And depending on your score, that mortgage insurance rate and that mortgage insurance payment goes a lot higher. So that's kind of how that works with the scoring. So it's 580, 620, 640, 680. And then when you reach 720, that's when your rates for conventional be begin to be a lot lower. That's when you can start asking for a lot more. You can ask for a better rate for mortgage insurance, uh, things of that nature. So those, those are the guidelines. 
Wow, those are some awesome benchmarks. I, no one has ever broken it down that clear. Wow, so thank you for that. That's amazing. So now I have some clients that come and they say, well, I have a pre-qualified, pre-qualified letter. Shouldn't that be okay? What's the difference between like a pre-qualified and a pre-approval so people can really know the difference if they're holding one or the other? Okay, so since Robin, I know you're an agent, I'm mm-hmm. gonna tell you how those work. Okay. <laughs> there's different chapters to it. And so as you can see with this, there's so many ifs, ands, or buts. Yes. It's almost like law school, right? <laughs> so well, there are different lenders pre different ways. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm glad you're learning, having this out here so clients will know and so will agents know. That's Some right. pre can be the client calls me and says, oh, I have great credit, I have a job, and um, this is where I work, and go ahead and pull my credit. Mm-hmm. And let's say the loan officer may pull their credit and say, oh yeah, you have a 680 credit score and you said you make $70,000 a year, you're here. Let me go ahead and send you a prequal letter, okay? Then there are some loan officers that will say, like for example, myself, I'm going to take your application, I'm going to pull your credit, and I want to see your bank statement. I want to see your pay stubs. I want to see your ID. I want to look at everything that comes up. Then when you fill out this application, I'm going to ask you questions about your job. I'm going to calculate your year to date. Well, based on your year to date, it seems like you were out of work for a month. What happened? Oh, I was sick. I had broke my leg and I stayed home. So I go through all of that. <laughs> and then, okay, I see on your pay stub, you're paying child support. How old is your child? Is the child 15 or 16 or is the child 10? Do I still have to keep counting this in your DTI? Right? So. That's still a part of pre-qualification process. Then I run it through what's called desktop underwriting. The desktop underwriter is the computerized underwriting system that we use for Fannie Mae, which is conventional, or Freddie Mac, which is conventional, or HUD, which is FHA, to see if it qualifies based on what they require, okay? And if I get what's called an approved eligible, I know I'm good to go. And what I have to do is prove everything that's on that application. If you said you worked at that job for two years, I need two years, not 23 months, (laughs) okay? (laughs) If you said you lived at this address for two years, I need 24 months proof that you lived at this address for two years, not 23 months, right? If you said you have $10,000 in the bank, I have to prove that you have the money in the bank and I know where it came from. Right? So that's part of the pre-qual. Now a pre-approval, okay, that is where I actually, after I reviewed your documents, I've actually given it to the underwriter. So not only have I reviewed it, desktop underwriter has reviewed it, and the actual physical underwriter has reviewed it and said that you are you are pre-approved. So that means she's already approved you, she's good to go, and maybe she just has some conditional questions that may need to be answered. So that's the difference. And sometimes for realtors, when they get pre-qual letters from loan officers that have not done the full due diligence, this is what will happen when you end up under contract and you're like, oh, well, this popped up. No, it really didn't pop up. You just didn't look for it ahead of time. You didn't look for it till afterwards. Now, sometimes things do pop up. The clients, they'll go out and buy a car. They'll go out and they'll buy furniture or they will go out and co-sign for their kids to get something and say, oh, I didn't know, I didn't know. Wow. You know, but ultimately that's kind of how it works. So that's why sometimes as a realtor, you have surprises because the loan officer, you have to know how do they vet the clients, what goes on. So when I talk to listing agents, that's what they do. They will call me and they will say, the experienced ones will call me and say, did you look at their pay stubs? Did you look at their W-2s? Did you look at their bank statements? Have you checked their rental history? Like they will seriously ask me that before they accept your offer. Wow, that's awesome, see? And that's why I have you on. This is amazing, good stuff for clients as well as for agents. They can ask the right questions so we can avoid you know, some of the mishap that be going on in the real estate world. And so now we get to the most often asked question. How do you qualify for the down payment assistance program with the Chinoa Fund? Everybody wants to know, is there free money out here? (laughs) Well, if you need what the first requirement is that you must have a 640 and you must be approved eligible through the desktop underwriting system for Fannie Mae or for FHA for HUD. 
okay? That's what's required. Is it free money? No, no money is ever free. It's always a cost. So in exchange for giving you the money that you don't have, you have to pay a higher interest rate. Okay, so did you really get the money for free? No, because when you do the math on it, yes, you loaned me, you loaned me $8,000 or $10,000, but my payment on my mortgage for the full amount is higher. So instead of being able, if the if the interest rates now are two and a half, I can't take that two and a half. I have to take the 3.625 because I want my down payment to be lent to me. Right, mm-hmm. but your payment is higher. Your payment may be higher a hundred, two hundred dollars a month because that's what you opted to do. Wow, so it's not free money. But is it a bad thing? Mm, no, because maybe you don't have the cash to put down. Mm-hmm. You don't have the seven or eight thousand or the ten thousand or the fifteen thousand dollars to put down. You don't have it. Right. But three point six two five is not a bad. Thing. No. But how do you how can you avoid staying in that situation, right? And you still want to you want to be smart about it. So you may say, "Okay, well I'm going to go ahead and take the 3.625 and I am going to work on paying off the money that I borrowed to put down mm-hmm. and I'm going to make sure I pay my bi-weekly payments so that I can refinance if the rates are lower later, I can refinance to that lower rate." So you're purchasing the money. No money is free. So it's basically two mortgages then. I have the mortgage that'll represent maybe the 80 or the 90%. And then I'll have that other piece, which represents my down payment, which is at a slightly higher rate. So it's, in essence, it's two mortgages that I have, a first and a second? Yes, you will have a first and a second. Your second, your first, let's say if it's FHA, mm-hmm. your first will be 96.5% of the loan amount. So let's just use even numbers, 100,000. Your first loan is $96,500. Okay. Your second mortgage is gonna be your down payment, which is which is the three and a half percent of the 100,000, which is 3,500. The interest rate on the 3.5, on the $3,500 is gonna be 8%, amortized over 10 years. Oh, 10 years, okay. Okay, your interest rate for the 96,500 is gonna be still dictated at 3.675. Gotcha. You get that? You see how that's not free money? It's not. You pay 8% on the 3,500, and then you pay a percentage more on the 96,500. So is it possible to have zero dollars and get a mortgage? No, you still need to have some money when you come right to the closing table or period. Because I don't want people to under an assumption that, oh, she said I can do that, you know, 96.5 and and I can take out the other and just pay a higher interest rate. But is it possible to have zero dollars and buy a house? Pardon my my facial expression. (laughs) Those days are over. Over, <laughs> over, over, over. <laughs> if you get a client, Robin, that says they have no money and they want special privileges with no money down, run. Stay home. <laughs> so no, it's not possible. It is not possible. I even had a client with a loan amount as low as eighty six thousand. He still had to come to closing with seven or eight hundred dollars. See, this is when I go back into that mindset. If you right. rent a property, right, you have to pay first and last month's rent. Mm-hmm. Right. That's right. You so you have to come up with money. So even if you're renting, mm-hmm. you have to come up with money. That's period. True. Okay. So when you buy a home, it's no different, right? You still need to you still need to have the mindset that hey, I'm gonna move into this property. I want a house. I need to come up with the money. So I want us to dispel this image of buying a house and not putting any money down because. What's happening is people that have money are like pushing those people out. Because um, um, you don't have any money. So it's kind of like, well, you can't come to play. It doesn't right. doesn't work that way. Right. You will need money because you still have to pay for your appraisal. That's right. You have to pay for an inspection. You have to pay for earnest money. Yeah. All those things have to be paid for. Yeah. All the time. So I tell my clients all the time, I, you have to have the money. But I work with my clients. If they're not ready right now, I say, okay, let's just start with your budget. Let's see where you're spending your money because you have it. You just, you're just spending it on something else. You just don't realize it. So no, there are no products that are available 
that allow you to walk into a property without spending a dime. Those days are over. Nice. I'm glad we dispelled that here. So lastly, I just have to ask, how long should they expect to take for a typical loan to close? Because nowadays, some people are estimating 45 days, 30 days. So does it really depend on the client or how much control do they have in getting that loan closed as soon as possible? Okay, so let me tell you the variations on the market on that. Okay. The variations in the market for closing a loan are anywhere from 20 to 45 days. Gotcha. These are the variables that affect that. Number one, the borrower and how good they are with submitting documents. Okay. I actually need to do a YouTube on how to print your, your, your paperwork on PDF. Why Absolutely. is that? Because the underwriters, we are paperless and the underwriters are underwriting your file on a computer screen. They have double, triple screens and they're reading your information. If your information has been faxed over and it is not clear, it's going to take her longer to read it. Absolutely. If you send over a bank statement and it came straight from Bank of America, it's PDF, it's clear, it's concise, and she can read through it real easy, like, oh, okay, (laughs) she'll get through your file a whole lot faster, Right. right? And then clients who don't know how to print the PDF, like I've had clients that didn't know how to use the computer, didn't know how to print their product. They're sending me screenshots of pay stubs on their phone. That doesn't work. Screenshots of their bank statements on their phone. That doesn't work. So it takes longer on the front end to get just the paperwork, okay? The other thing that dictates that is the lender and what their turn time is for underwriting. So every lender's turn time is different. Um, And then on top of that, the other thing that affects the turn time is the turn time for the appraisal. So like right now, I've been asking my clients, just go ahead and pay the extra $50 for a rush appraisal so we can avoid waiting seven to 10 days for an appraisal, okay? Um, And the other thing that dictates the process is how well the clients pretty much have had their paperwork together or how well they can put it together or how solid their deal is. So like if they've worked at the same job for two years, they've been saving their money, um, they've lived in the same place for two years, they don't have a lot of extra things going on, they don't have a lot of things on their credit that they have to explain, those files tend to go through a lot faster. Wow, this was great, great, great information. I know there's so much more information out there and we can probably sit here all day, but this was an awesome start. At least I can't thank you enough for your time and your in-depth knowledge on how mortgages can help people. This is amazing. Tell people how they can get in contact with you if they're interested in using your services. If they're getting a mortgage, I couldn't understand why they wouldn't be. How could we get in contact with you? Okay, well, my phone number is 404 404- three nine nine six nine six one and my email address is e smith that's like ellie smith s-m-i-t-h at mmi.biz my mortgage incorporated dot biz b-i-z wow this again was so amazing i can't thank you enough there you have it ladies and gentlemen insight into the mortgage process from the industry expert, Elisa Smith. Contact her if you have any questions and she'd be so happy to help you. If you're buying or selling in Gwinnett County, give the Atlantic Elite team a call. We would love to help you with your next move. Remember to subscribe and hit that notification icon so you'll be in the know of when we drop our next video. And while you're here thinking about mortgages, check out our video on credit repair so you'll be prepared to create your life in Gwinnett. Click the link below for your free credit tips guide.